seen in what Plato referred to as a world of ideas. Now often people, particularly in the Western world today, think of this as something very dry and abstract, it's very intellectual, but actually it's something very important to understand that our ability to think, what we sometimes think of as an intellectual way, is a transition stage to a new form of clairvoyance. That's a very important concept for us. That as we mentioned on Saturday, the methods of developing clairvoyance have changed over human history. And at any particular given time in history, the human subtle bodies and consciousness is in a given state. So we have to start from that state and then move it to the next stage. So for us right now, having particular concepts that are spiritual in nature and are accurate actually help to form a foundation for a spiritual organ to perceive the thing that we have the concept for. I'll give you a concrete example of what I mean by this. You often hear these stories about, in our modern Western culture, we have a concept of snow. But for an Eskimo, they might have 30 different words for snow. And it's 30 different things, because they have a word for it. They have a concept for it. That means they cannot perceive different things. Other people cannot perceive because they do not have the concept. This is similar to what you find in Japan where in Japan there are all these beautiful, subtle concepts that have to do with aspects of art, sabi and wabi, all of these very subtle art concepts. And in Japanese, they even have a word for the feeling that you get emotionally on the second of the three days of the Cherry Blossom Festival, because they're that precise about internal states. So you can recognize these things in these cases uh, in a way that is governed by the concepts we have. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up right now, because I'm laying a foundation for the practices we're going to do, is that in, for example, the Rosicrucian tradition, which I mentioned multiple times, because it's one of the most recent traditions, and so it has a lot of updated information in it, plenty of important information to pull from many other traditions, but particularly with Rudolf Steiner's work in the last century, it's very updated to the modern day. There is this whole aspect that Many traditions have multiple stages of initiation, and that's true for the Rosicrucian tradition too. There are seven stages of initiation. And we go through all this type of information in my online class, Spiritual Science Essential Teachings and Practices. For our workshop tonight, I just want to touch on one part of it. And that is that the first stage of Rosicrucian initiation is that of essentially studying spiritual science. So there's a reason why I'm presenting work in the world under the name of spiritual science. It's actually the first stage of the initiation process. And within the classes, I'll go to the later stages as well. But it starts with the study of spiritual science. Why? Not because we want to get stuck in intellectual abstractions, which spiritual study today too often gets stuck in, but rather because having true spiritual concepts allows us to develop a new organ of spiritual perception, to see and understand things we could not see and understand otherwise. So for example, as you're beginning to do direct perceptive works of higher worlds, you may have a spiritual being working with you that's trying to show you particular things. It's trying to give you certain types of information. This happens all the time. The question is how conscious are you? How far does it have to put the impulse down into your feeling or your will because your mind can't yet receive it? But if you have certain concepts in your mind, let's say it's trying to tell you about some type of spiritual reality. Maybe you're an energy healer and you're learning a new method which you can more effectively heal people's karmic issues and constitutional problems that come from them. The spiritual being is trying to tell you something, but it can't give you very precise information unless you have the capacity to differentiate amongst certain things in the higher worlds. So if we don't have a differentiation between the concept of the human etheric life body she, he, prana, many names in different traditions, but the pure life force of the human body. If we don't know the difference between that and the astral body of consciousness, and the difference between the astral body of consciousness and other higher bodies that are described by different names in different traditions, then the being can only give us very general information. But by having concepts of how things come in, it actually allows us to get all types of information downloaded. The more you know, the more you can know. It's not even possible, for example, in advanced levels of modern physical science to teach someone things like higher levels of radiation physics if they don't have the basics first. Otherwise, they wouldn't even understand the discussion. Same thing in metaphysics. Without a foundation, the essentials, you can't even do or talk about more essential work. The foundation hasn't been laid. 
which again is why when I made an online class, the first one was Essential Teachings and Practices, forming the initial foundation. So understanding this about the process we have gone through of losing our old clairvoyance, becoming more concretized into our present personality, ego separation from the world, and that can then have an initiation ascent back into spirit, but this time fully self-aware, where we weren't self-aware thousands of years ago, is part of the purpose of human earthly incarnation. And so is the fact that we are given the draft of forgetfulness. Again, for an initiate, they develop structures in their subtle bodies that allow them to maintain consciousness across any boundaries, whether between sleep and waking, or between one lifetime and another lifetime. But we get the draft of forgetfulness, and it creates a very strong pulling from a person's deep core, their greatest strengths. Because what could take more effort than being put helpless and in the greatest level of insomnia possible into a physical body in a strange world, and then having to figure out not only how to be successful in that world, but also to remember who you are and to begin to manifest your spiritual self. This calls on extremely deep levels of our own internal structure. And so that's what's behind a lot of the spiritual initiation work. So that's a little foundation there. Now, as we mentioned in the Saturday talk, connected to the reason why the second online class that we've done in Vesica is on connecting to spiritual beings, we reach the point where we begin to perceive non-physical beings, non-physical realities. And one of the first rules for that that we need to remember is a concept that used to be repeated like a mantra by Dr. Samuel Sagan, and I trained with him in Australia. And again, he had trained in the Babaji lineage. And that is that your ability to see is governed by your ability to not react. Anything you react to that you perceive spiritually, you will begin to distort it. And so your ability to see spiritually is governed by your ability to not react to the things that come up in your internal experience. So this requires a particular type of training of the mind, a particular type of training of the emotions, so that we can keep crystal clear mindfulness while not going into reactive states when we see things that might either really attract us, and then we do what the Tibetans call grasping. Wow, look at that incredible thing. And you try to grasp it, and it disappears. You have to just stay calm and keep observing. Or you'll see things that might appear horrific to you. And if you go, ah, and recoil, then again, you're going to distort whatever it is that you perceive. It requires complete equanimity, which is easier said than done. All these things in initiation, it's fine to talk about them abstractly, like, oh, yeah, you need to have complete equanimity. But to actually do it is a whole other ballgame. So as we develop the capacity to not react to what we see, to remain completely calm, a lot of this is connected to what we described in the Saturday talk as the capacities of receptivity. Receptive meditation, as we described before, are things like Zen, or Vipassana, or Transcendental Meditation, where we can keep the mind clear. Because to really perceive higher worlds, you can't do it in an accurate way unless you can hold the mind clear. Otherwise, you're constantly projecting all of your own stuff out there. And there's a particular rule I should make you aware of right now for certain higher worlds, and that is that things are inverted. For example, Rudolf Steiner in his work talks about the way that when you read certain things in the astral light, they'll appear completely reversed from how they appear in the physical plane. 135 might appear as 531. If you look on particular illustrations on the Egyptian temple walls, they show a person being guided by a higher spiritual being, a netta, and looking at particular higher beings that are walking, and then they're reflected directly beneath them. So you see the same being standing upright, and then it's reflected inverted beneath it. And this is actually shown on some of the Egyptian temple walls. This process of reflection, reversal, works on all kinds of aspects in the higher world. We could spend the next three hours just talking about that one principle that's so important. I just want to make one aspect of it right now, and that is that when we are projecting something outward and we're perceiving on the astral plane, we will often see it as if it's approaching us. Now, this is an explanation for things like why people that are going through drug withdrawal or DTs or alcohol withdrawal, things of that kind, they might see these horrible demonic forms coming at them. But part of that is actually what they're sending out of them. They're things that are being projected from them. 
certain types of elemental things they themselves have generated internally, but because of this reversal that the average person doesn't know anything about, it looks like this being is coming toward them. So we need to be aware that if we're not careful, anything we project will look like it's coming toward us, and we'll actually mistake it for actual spiritual realities. Or at the very least, we'll be dealing with a real spiritual reality, but we'll be corrupting it with the way that we're projecting things onto it. So as we develop this receptive capacity to not react to what we see, to just observe, this requires a type of reversal again of our normal reaction. Our normal reaction is very interesting, go toward it. If you don't like it, ah, recoil. Basic type of sympathy and antipathy. That's gotta be completely reversed to where when we want to take an internal action, we'll have an internal reaction, we have to, instead of moving out, we have to relax further. So things that normally would activate us in a particular way, we have to change that to where we then relax more deeply. And again, that's easier said than done. But if you see something really amazing and fantastic spiritually, and if instead of grasping it or recoiling, you relax further, it'll begin to open up further, and you can see more and more. What a lot of people perceive in spiritual visions are flashes. And the reason there are flashes is because they reacted, and it's gone. But if you can learn to develop this new capacity of relaxing, that perception that you have, whether it's imagination, inspiration, or intuition, will begin to open up more and more. And you'll find there's a lot more to what was being shown to you, but you weren't able to stay in that condition long enough to really be shown what they wanted to show you. And so when we talk about this idea of beginning to perceive non-physical realities from the foundations of initiation with us, it has to do, once again, with connecting with spiritual beings. Because we have spiritual beings around us all the time. This room is full of spiritual beings. Every person in this room has multiple spiritual beings that are connected with them. Some on a more permanent basis, and some kind of come and go. We are, again, like fish in an aquarium that don't know we're surrounded by water. But the water is the spiritual world. And spiritual beings are flowing around us at all times. And to spiritual beings, unless a person has done higher level development to create certain types of strong energetic boundaries, spiritual beings flow right through your energy field. And they can flow right through your body. And they'll leave particular types of trails behind that you might experience, if you're not fully conscious, as a thought, or as a feeling, or as an impulse to action. That could be good or it could be bad. Now it's passively understood that the higher spiritual being that we're all fundamentally connected to is a being from the spiritual hierarchy, or the angelic life, as we would say in the West, that's closest to us. And so that would be an angel per se, because the esoteric knowledge of higher beings has been pretty watered down in the West in the last few hundred years. People don't really understand the different levels of angelic beings. That's something we go into in the Connecting Spiritual Beings online course. But I'll just say right now that the right closest to us is known classically as the angels, and then above is the archangels, and then the archai, and then the Elohim, etc. So the angels are very close to us. And our connection to the angels is that they're the closest in development to us. Basically, spiritual beings go through a cycle. In sacred geometry, it's a circle. A complete cycle of development, and then once you reach the end of the cycle of development, you move up to the next octave, and you do another cycle of development. So it's like this constant Jacob's ladder of a vortex, a spiral movement upward, one after another. And so that's true for these higher spiritual beings as well. We're going through our spiritual adolescence to where we're semi-conscious, just like an adolescent, and we're like thrown back and forth by all of our emotional reactions and traumas and desires. We're getting to the point that we can settle down the mind and the emotions and begin to actually crystallize a spiritual core. Now, higher beings have already done that, yeah, but they keep developing higher and higher stages of development of consciousness. So the beings closest to us are what we classically know as the angels, although often the term angel stays uses a generic term for any type of higher being. So within the angels, because they are close to us, their relationship to us is similar to that of a parent to a child. Or if we were 